Good evening uh, and welcome to our conversation about our new public engagement project, the We Care Medicinal Garden. We're bringing this talk to you as part of the Dundee Science Festival. I'm Erin Halliburton and I will be joined by Kevin Frediani, the uh, curator of the Dundee Botanic Gardens, and Andrew, Andrew Matewa is joining us all the way from Malawi. If you have any questions throughout the event, please put them in the chat and we'll answer them or we'll try and answer them as we go along. So I'm Irene Halliburton and I am a malaria researcher in the Drug Discovery Unit as part of the Welcome Centre for Anti-Infective Research. So the idea behind the garden came about a few years ago when we had a new building. Um, so it's called the Discovery Centre. And outside the, the building, there is there was a fairly unimaginative garden put in place. And I thought, you know, this, this is a, a lost opportunity. We should really be putting something in there that is um, related to what we do in the building, particularly working on drug discovery. Now, you may or may not know this, but two of the main drugs for malaria uh, are actually plant-based. So artemisinin comes from artemisia and uh, quinine, which has been used for hundreds of years for malaria, comes from the cinchona tree. Uh, I actually have a cinchona tree in my office nowadays. So the plants are helping keep, keep our offices health, healthy as well. So this kind of, you know, I, I thought, this is a good idea, it'll never happen. And then I think maybe about a year and a half ago, the, the Welcome Centre put out a call for um, projects to be funded. And I'd been involved in quite a few public engagement projects and I'm always quite keen on things that engage adults as well as children. And I thought, Do you know what, this is the time to, um, to push the garden. So I, you know, put my time where my mouth was and um, built up the, the proposition and uh, the board agreed with it. We have, we've, we've changed the plot a little bit and we've moved from one part of the building to the other. So again, you might be aware that we have an art, an art gallery as part of the Welcome Centre. And the, the piece of land outside it is, it used to be a main entrance, but it's become a little bit neglected. Uh, it's really just a big square of um, grass. And the slide you can actually see now is the mock-up that uh, Kevin did for us. So to avoid any underground services and things that are always outside buildings like ours, we're going to put in a set of raised beds. These will be fully accessible. Um, you know, we'll be able to get uh, wheelchairs around them. It'll be um, relatively solid standing. Um, so the garden will be, it's there for everybody. And I think what we want it to be, or what I certainly always had the vision for it to be, is a space that can be used to help introduce people outside the building to what we do inside the building. And that can be to do with the science, to do with the, the drugs that we produce or the drugs that we research but it also helps link into our art gallery. So it, it makes the, the um, entrance to the art gallery much more attractive too. We can use the space for formal public engagement, but we also plan to have it to, for people to be able to, to drop in on, on their way past. Where it sits is a, a route in and out of campus. In fact, in and out of the centre of Dundee, people walk, walk down this way all the time just opposite Hawk Hill. And it's an opportunity for people to stop for a second. We're going to have some seating, people can have some seats in a, in a, in a really nice, nice area. So that, that's kind of the plan. And not long after I had started to, or been given the go ahead to put things together, um, Kevin Frediani started at the Botanic Garden. And within Kevin's first week, uh, I got a hold of him on the phone and I think he was maybe slightly alarmed um, at this 
crazy women going, this, we're going to do this. And he's like, whoa, hold on. But where we are so far, Kevin has been completely on board with this. So I'm going to introduce you to first Kevin and, and then Andrew. So um, Kevin Frediani is a manager with over 30 years experience in the land use sector. Currently, as I've said, is the curator of the Botanic Gardens and head of grounds at Dundee University. He leads a team there that seeks to deliver sustainable green infrastructure across the university campuses. To actually bring the Botanic Garden onto campus is one, one of the things that Kevin has, has said to me is really interested in doing. He's also a Tayside Circular Economy Ambassador promoting sustainable business practice. And his previous experience is gained in a wide range of um, outdoor uh, gardens and things, heritage landscapes, botanic gardens, zoos, uh, and, and urban spaces as well. Apparently in his spare time, Kevin makes and plays five string banjos. Maybe he'll give us Give us a tune later. Yeah. And has also yeah. been leading for a master's in sustainable rural development, which will enhance his understanding of human ecology and sustainable development across the rural sectors. So if I can pass over to Kevin to tell us a bit about uh, his role in, in our garden and um, where he sees we can all tie up. Kevin? Thank you. If I can have my um, first first slide up, what I'm going to actually try to do, Irene, thanks for that introduction, is um, take you through a brief history of botanic gardens and then I'll bring it up to where we are now. As you say, in terms of linking this um, botanic garden concept with the physic garden, but also with improving the campus itself for well-being, for wildlife and for, for the benefits of all of our uh, local community. Uh, the next slide um, takes us into um, the first, first of what we call scientific or physic garden that's recognised, where there is a Hortus um, medicus at, at uh, Pisa. If you think about the Italian Renaissance and the scientific Renaissance in the Middle Ages, around Tuscany there was this uh, revolution in botanic gardens, which were teaching then um, both uh, physicians but also those physicians being people who um, gave you a prescription, if you like, for a medicine, but also apothecaries. And this is an important distinction. Those people who were actually making those preparations, we call them chemists today. And you can see that the format of this garden is very much laid out. It's um, has symmetry. It's actually a design that goes all the way back through um, to the very first monastic gardens that we see in Egypt in about the third uh, third century BC and how we know that is from uh, plans that Charlemagne from the last Roman Emperor uh, in, in 80, 800 AD um, revealed for uh, a, a garden in, in Switzerland called St Gallen that was never actually realised but it provides us this really good framework for gardens that were being created. Um, the, the evolution of, of um, physic gardens became very widespread at this time and that again is linked it's very very contemporary in a way it was linked to the uh, to the black plague and if you think about the roles of herbs being primarily medicinal and and then supporting through the, the physicians uh, the treatment of this disease we've got a very very big association between teaching gardens preparation and rather than actually gardens for preparation because the apothecaries would have had their own herbal gardens on a much smaller scale um, can I have the next slide, please? I'm now going to take you through to uh, Amsterdam Botanic Gardens. Ali, could you flip slides for me, please? Thank you. We've got um, the first garden that I actually worked in, which was a, um, a Hortus uh, Wombach, um, a, um, a Hortus uh, Medicus. But it became very quickly through the uh, curator, which is Johanna Snippendahl in, in uh, who, who was appointed in 1638, one back please, um, to the, uh, became, became the uh, uh, Hortus botanicus. And the distinction between them is one's growing medicinal plants 
for training apothecaries and the other actually collecting plants as the world was opening up. And if you think about the role of the Dutch uh, sailing the seas and bringing plants back from around the world, from South Africa, from uh, New Amsterdam, which became uh, New York in, in North America, these plants were being brought back and collected. And we had this transition from Hortus um, Medicus to Hortus Botanicus, and they're very quickly through the sciences in, into the botanic gardens that we see today. I wanted to flag up, we've recently discovered that Patrick Blair in 1708 talks about a physic garden in Dundee, which he had, which if, if this is true and we can find out where it was, is actually the third uh, known physic garden in, in the UK. Um, that would be behind uh, Oxford, which was in 1631, and um, uh, the Chelsea physic garden, which uh, next slide, please. Uh, so I want to end with just giving you an idea of where we are in this relationship between the botanic gardens, where this where this new um, physic garden is going, and the campus. We've got uh, we're, we're the botanic garden is 27 acres of, of mainly ecological plantings. It was laid out in uh, 1971, so it's a young botanic garden, but for the teaching of ecology. So we don't have that lineage that takes us back. Uh, we don't actually don't have a physic garden. Um, so this fits in really well with giving us a link between the science going on within the university as we try to en enhance and improve the campus and make it a well-being campus. Um, the the we um, uh, car physic garden is actually uh, on, the, on the left hand side of the map there. So if you're coming onto the university campus, it will be um, accessible from uh, uh, um, uh, uh, easily accessible from the city centre to actually come and enjoy. Thank you very much. I'll hand you over there. Thank you, Kevin. Can I just ask you um, a question just now? So, working in uh, tropical diseases, quite a lot of the um, tropical disease research facilities are in ports. Do you think there is maybe also a link between the early physic gardens and ports? Yes, almost um, almost definitely. I think if you if you go back, there's actually uh, uh, transport and everything is related yeah. to this because we, we mainly transported things around the world by by ship, by water. It's the easiest route for transport. It's only much later that we see the evolution of rail and then roads. Um, so I think, yes, almost definitely linked link together and yeah. probably you'll find that if you think about the um, the link as well, um, botany was taught as part of medicine up until uh, uh, the, the end of the um, 19th century. So if, if you've got something like Grindon's botany, if you studied uh, botany in, in uh, Manchester in 1890, Grindon's botany was a standard text and it was a text for your second year in uh, medical sciences and mm -hmm. um, so lot lot this link was is only tenuously pulled apart when we start seeing the advance of chemistry and pharmacy moves away from whole, whole plants into uh, the substances that, that um, are then used and synthesized so yeah. thank you cool thank you uh, so i would now like to introduce um, andrew matewa who joins us from uh, malawi so andrew is a medicinal chemist who's started from plant-based natural drug discovery in Malawi and now uses it as some of the source material for his current work in designing and researching new drugs. Andrew visited Dundee this year as part of this, or last year and beginning of this year under the Centre's training programme for as part of his PhD. He is a Malawan who enjoys Krav Manga, which I had to Google and find out is a, a martial art loves heavy rock music and enjoys video games. He does science for a living and enjoys it more because it asks questions about everything. He's a faculty member at Malawi University and uh, has just finished writing a textbook in natural products, which I was quite impressed uh, and looks really good. I'm, I definitely want to read that when it comes out. Thank you, Irene. Um, thank you, everybody, for <coughs> for joining us. Uh, so, as Irene has pointed out already, I work in drug discovery. So, I'm a medicinal chemist. 
uh, but <clears throat> my background comes from uh, natural products. So first of all, I'd like to, to talk about natural products the way we've been doing it here in Malawi and some other parts of Africa. So in Malawi, natural products have been used from history uh, as therapeutic agents. And so uh, Malawi is one of the countries that uses natural products um, as one of the primary medical health care. Um, and, and, and when we talk about conventional drugs, they come secondary because of access uh, to drugs and conventional health care. So the conversation um, about natural products in Malawi started late 1960s and early 1970s when people started to, to discuss natural products in the scientific sense and in terms of research. There are uh, a few papers that are available online that are to do with natural products uh, in the country. Um, we have some plants that have been found to be endemic to the country and uh, generally, what I can say is, looking back, uh, we haven't made uh, very good use of the science uh, that natural products provides us. Um, some four to five years ago, um, one of the professors that I made at one of the local universities here asked me a question on why I'm interested in working on natural products. I gave him my story, I gave him my, int my, my the picture that I had uh, to do with natural products, how natural products can intervene in healthcare in the country. Then the question that he gave me was, I've heard about natural products in the country from around 1960s and 1970s, but up to now, I don't see any progress. Why haven't you come, came up, come up with any maybe formidable product that we can point out that natural products has given us this maybe drug that has been patented or at least approved maybe by the FDA? So that gave me a picture that, OK, maybe everything that we are doing right now about natural products is not necessarily the end but probably the means or the beginning. So I started working um, on natural products and then to go beyond what we usually do. So what we normally do in Malawi and some other countries is the use of natural products is basically crude. So we have abundant natural products, a variety, we rich in biodiversity, various species and various species that that have traditionally been known to cure some diseases and some that have also been proven to cure, uh, scientifically cure some diseases. But we haven't done much in, in putting together the traditional knowledge and the scientific knowledge, putting together to foster progress that can uh, maybe take us from uh, crude extracts that we use to coming up with a final product that we can all say this is an approved drug or maybe a vaccine altogether. So these questions are the ones that um, opened a new door for me. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, if you walk in towns and some of the villages that we have in the country along the roads, you may be lucky to find that we have some herbalists that that ply alongside the roads. You find that most of the herbal products that we have, uh, we just take plants as they are, maybe we get roots, we get uh, maybe the bark or maybe leaves, and then we soak them in water. And then uh, the herbalist from experience knows exactly uh, what this particular concoction can treat and what this concoction may not treat. Now, the, the scientific question that we bring in there is, this is a crude extract. It contains a lot of compounds. Uh, yes, we know that maybe it, it works, but how how about if we put in a scientific aspect to the uh, the uh, the concoction? How about if you look at the compounds that are really responsible for the healing? How about if you look at uh, some other side effects that maybe we have ignored along the way? Maybe during the time that we're using, we haven't paid attention. Then we don't have an idea whether the concoction is toxic or not. So coming to that point, it's where we come. Uh, uh, into drug designing and medicinal chemistry. Uh, now we are not using, we are trying to foster or to uh, encourage the science where we are taking natural products, not as the final product, but just as a means uh, or the starting material that we can use to, to uh, develop 
newer drugs that may be able to replace maybe drugs that have gone obsolete or maybe drugs that have faced resistance or maybe new drugs altogether. So basically that's what we are doing uh, in Malawi and the picture that we have in natural product use. Uh, thank you, Irene. Thank you, Andrew. Um, so we've got uh, some questions um, for everyone. Uh, so the first one I'm going to put to both Andrew and um, Kevin. What brought you both to Dundee? What's nice, what's good about Dundee? Andrew, shall I go first on that one? OK, I'll go first. Um, yeah, so I I went to Dundee uh, because I had the quest to look for drug discovery, to add more knowledge to drug discovery beyond the level that we work on herbal extracts. So I wanted to go beyond that to look at drug designing and also drug synthesis. So I could use products that I get from natural products as starting materials or maybe some models that we can work towards. So when I'm designing a drug, for example, today, I'm able to have a picture that, OK, I have maybe, for example, a compound that I know it works from plants and then I can just have um, maybe go to the lab or maybe on a computer, design a compound that can mimic maybe that uh, particular natural product compound. So I went to Dundee mostly to uh, work on um, to add value to drug discovery, to go beyond herbal extracts, to do designing, to do synthesis as part of my PhD. Can can I ask you too, Andrew? Um, the plants, the natural plant products that you work on in Malawi, are they native plants? It's a combination. Uh, we have, I know a few native plants that uh, go with the genus, um, uh, the species Nyasika, so that's endemic. They are native to the country, but most of the plants that I've been working with are not native. There are just a few that are na that I know to be native. Thank you. And Kevin, why? What brought you to Dundee? Well, I've uh, I've been living and working in um, Scotland previously, up in the in the Northwest Highlands, looking after an estate and 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 famous garden. But Dundee gave me the opportunity of not only working in a in a maturing living collection, but it was the appeal of the campus and this link between urban and rural. If you think about the big challenges of our time, there are nature based solutions for almost all of them. However, uh, we sit at a time where two out of every five plants in the world is under threat of extinction, as the new, the latest Q2020 uh, report, um, the threats to plants and fungi show. So there is a there's an education aspect there's a an opportunity to conserve plants but also linked with the with the university where we are we can actually uh, support research which we can put into practice and I, I think there's nowhere else i know of at the moment that you can do that on the scale of the canvas that dundee provides so that that, that kind of leads me on um to to ask him what you hope people who visit our little garden will get out of it? Um, so in terms of the uh, the link for me, Irene, when you came, it was like a gift. On one level, I was thinking, why would we create a physic garden on the main campus when we've got a botanic garden? I think that's the first question I asked you. And yeah, then I think actually, so. Yeah. In that early conversation, it became very apparent, actually, the opportunity, the gift you were giving me was access to live research. You know, if you think about the purpose of a university, it's research to gain knowledge that we can then share through education. And we're better to actually create a physic garden and outside of a centre of research where we can then together help impart knowledge to those people who will hopefully benefit from it. Um, so it's a lovely juxtaposition. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, yeah, I think sort of one of my um, big things for, for the garden is to create links. And even at the moment, while we, we've kind of been held up a bit by by the COVID crisis, 
you know, we, we really had hoped to have the garden fully planted and open by now. Even through that, we've been able to create links between um, people who are interested in helping out with it. We've got students from the art college involved in it. Um, you know, we've been speaking to someone in the history department. So even, even though it doesn't exist at the moment, it's bringing groups of people together and it's connecting people's research. So, I, I mean, even so far, I think we, we, it's, it's, it's really starting to create links, which is one of the big things that I, I had really hoped that it would do. So I've got a couple of other questions here. Um, so someone is asking what natural plant products are being used in medical research today? Um, so I think I'll, I'll have a go at answering this. So quite a lot of the things that we use, um, even as, norm, as normal drugs, uh, in, in, so both in research and in the clinic, are derived from, from plants. So the, you know, I, I've already mentioned the Artemisia and quinine for malaria, which are both still frontline treatments. We're all aware of aspirin that comes from willow. We are all aware of morphine, which comes from poppies. One of the newer ones that is in, thank you, <laughs> one of the newer ones that is in the clinic just now is uh, galantine, which is from snowdrops and also from um, daffodils. We have a snowdrop picture. Yay! So this was actually taken from one of the other researchers who is involved in uh, working in the garden, who's also a keen photographer. So I don't think we'll ever stop looking to the plant world for, for, new, for new treatments. Someone also connected to this, um, someone is also asking, is it just trial and error that finds plants that might have medicinal properties? Or do we have information that helps us find them? So most of the plants that we now have identified active substances from, so real drugs from, have been used for a very long time in um, in herbal race. In back, oh sorry, back from these physic gardens, early physic gardens that that Kevin's talking about. It's really only more recently that we have started to identify the active ingredient. So, and, and we're still looking, things like St John's wort, we're still looking at these to, to identify the active ingredients. Thank you. Um, I'm trying to, but we, we also have things which were thought to have active properties, but we haven't found any yet. Uh, one of these, which we've actually put in the garden, is uh, lung wort. And one of the reasons that it is thought to help with lung disease is that the leaves have a pat pattern that looks like lungs. People have tried to find an ingredient in that that, that actually has, um, that helps respiratory complaints. But as far as I'm aware, we haven't actually, we haven't found um, anything yet. I hope that, that answers your questions. Irene, you're on, you were on mute. I'm sorry, I was on mute all the way through that answer. OK, so the questions we had, what natural products are being used in medical research today? So we have lots of um, natural plant products that are still being used in the clinic and in research today. So. We have new. We have some that we are still looking at. So St John's Wort, uh, we are no, we are now looking at these for the treatment of depression, which and it's been used for a very long time. But only recently have we discovered the the active ingredients. Aspirin comes from willow and many other um, plants. We have um, uh, from poppies. We have morphine. 
uh, from one of the, the the newer ones that we have now is um, from daffodils and from snowdrops, which is galatine, which is used for uh, Parkinson's disease. So the other question we have there, is it just trial and error that finds plants that might have medicinal properties or do we have information that helps us find them? So a lot of these plants that uh, we're talking about and will be going into the garden have been used in um, herbaries for many, many years and have been in physic gardens for hundreds of years. We are still, um, most of these are now being um, researched to try and find the active ingredient. Plants often have very small amounts of these compounds, so it becomes really difficult to use these as, as drugs because purifying the active in ingredient can be difficult. But if we can identify that, then the chemist can actually make it in the lab and make it much more um, available to other people. So the question I was going to ask Andrew, um, you've worked in both uh, Dundee and in Malawi. What are the differences between working in the two places? Uh, thank you, Irene. Um, the difference is um, <clears throat> very, very huge. Uh, so I can say that working in Dandy, for example, the Dandy labs are very well equipped. So you know exactly what you're looking for. So it's very easy for you to draw your plan for maybe for the day because you know that every plan that you make, you're going to be able to meet maybe the objectives by the end of the day because uh, the resources are available. So you are not limited in thinking. So uh, you can think uh, uh, maybe I can say maybe the sky could be uh, your limit, but also working back home here, it's exciting that uh, maybe we are doing this kind of science, but the challenge comes in when we start implementing this kind of science, drug discovery, for example. Um, we can have ideas, we can read, we can look at literature, uh, but the challenge comes in when we start thinking about resources. Uh, so you talk about uh, drug discovery, for example, it's very expensive. Um, for example, my work here uh, right now faces a lot of challenges because um, one, maybe the area of drug discovery is not as familiar as maybe it is in Dundee or most parts of Europe, maybe and the waste. But uh, when I look at uh, everything that we have here, the limitations that we have in terms of resources, in terms of maybe personnel that are already working in that area, uh, you see that here I could be the scientist, but when I was in Dundee, I could just be one of the scientists. So you can look at the difference there already that uh, there's no easy local collaboration because um, there are a few people that work in that area practically. So most of the things that we focus on are maybe based on theory because we can't practically do, we are limited mm. in those terms. So generally that's the difference. Uh, I can do a lot much more in Dundee uh, than yeah. I can do right here. We certainly do have um, all the resources uh, to our hand. Oh yeah. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. We're, we're, we're very, very fortunate. Yeah. Kevin, can I ask you, uh, and I'm going to answer this as well, what's your favourite medicinal plant and why? Oh, um, <laughs> I think I think um, I think from a, a sort of a personal link with a plant, it comes down to a tropa belladonna, um, which was is actually um, is toxic. So in, in mm. terms of um, but it was also used by the Egyptians to dilate the eye, eyes, to beautify the eyes with a, um, on one level. So it's got this um, aesthetic property to it, this killer property to it. And actually in the garden with its uh, big uh, succulent berries, it looks like something that, that will feed the birds for weeks and weeks and weeks. So it has yeah. all the attributes. So that's what I choose. Yeah. Cool. Andrew, do you have a, a favourite medicinal plant? Uh, yes, uh, it's commonly known as uh, iboga. Um, huh? It's mostly iboga. It's common in West Africa and some parts of Central Africa. Uh, it's used uh, mostly against um, 
uh, drug addiction. So okay. traditionally, pe people in those countries use ibogaine. They have a compound called uh, ibogaine. So the compound is, um, acts against or suppresses uh, effects of um, drug addic addictions. And it's believed that people get well after uh, some time of use of the compound. Mm, that's good. Yeah. Yeah. So my favorite one is, of course, attached to my to my work. And I, I think that's artemisinin. So we've just put that into the garden this week. Um, I've got some, or artemisia, I've got some out in my garden. And there's, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, I'm a fan of an occasional alcoholic beverage. And um, people didn't believe me about this connection with uh, artemisia and absinthe. But artemisia is actually a wormwood. And absinthe has wormwood in it. So as well as helping prevent you get malaria, you also get a nice little drink at the same time. But the other, the other alcohol link with uh, malaria is uh, quinine, is in tonic. And quinine was first um, given to people in India against malaria. So they, to make it a bit more palatable, they made it into tonic. They added uh, some sugar and some fizzy water and some other flavours um, and then stuck some gin in it as well. So uh, most of my favourite medicinal plants are also linked uh, with a little drink. So I've got another question here about um, growing plants all year round so we can actually use the um, so we, we could actually use the, the extracts. And I think, Kevin, you you have your greenhouses that uh, if we needed to do that, we could, um, we could. Absolutely, I think there's two elements there. If you think about the properties that we're thinking of as medicinal, actually in terms of the evolution of the plant, these, these plant secondary metabolites are defensive. They're there to stop browsing and grazing by animals mm. so that they can stay so um what's really interesting about their their uh, the properties of plants growing in the open and harvested in the summer they were at higher levels of plant secondary metabolites so therefore if you want to in this country gather and harvest them for that purpose you're better off doing it with supplementary light and heat or if you're thinking about your carbon footprint you might actually look at those being imported in uh, from somewhere where there's that you'd offset that carbon against how much it would take for us to heat a glass house to grow. Mm. Um, but I think th these are all things that are possible. We've got glass houses. We grow at the moment uh, three and a half thousand plants, uh, different plants in the botanic gardens. They're mostly woody. I'd like to move towards more herbaceous plants, but we've always got glass house space available in between this that, that could support research on site. Yeah, I mean, I, I think uh, one of the things that I would also quite like the garden to be able to do would be to grow individual plants in enough quantity that when people like Andrew do come to, to train, that they could actually also be teaching people how to create these crude extracts. So it, it's a thing that um, school kids could be learning to do. You know, if they, if they can make extracts from, from willow or you know, from a, a really straightforward um, plant, then, you know, that, that's a really good um, process for people to learn how to do. So, Kevin, you might be able to, th th this is kind of what you were talking about before. We have another question here about um, growing plants at different times of year and harvest them, harvesting them and then having a uh, Different levels of um, different levels of of drug in them. Does it make a difference if it's after rain or things like that? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I should say that alongside this work, one of my former roles was actually growing plants within a zoo, um, London Zoo and Whipstay Zoos, and also in Paynton Zoo down in Devon. And what I learned about um, when we, we actually started growing what we call browse plants and food plants for the animals, we were, we were nutritionally testing them through the different seasons and we saw different levels of tannin, different levels of, of, of the properties that you're looking at in terms of the medicinal uh, properties, but also toxins. And uh, they do vary through the seasons. They vary with both woody plants 
you can imagine those plants that that um over winter below ground they don't have anything you can harvest in the winter above mm. ground so it's not leaf but within their bulbs it tends to be concentrated if it's a, a bulb that they overwinter as or in the stolons if that's the form so each plant has um, a different life strategy but through the seasons they would definitely have different levels of uh, of um, nutrition in them but also these plant secondary metabolites we can also manipulate it one of the projects i was involved in 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 Painton zoo was actually i i had the world's first production vertical farm and i grew 18 different types of basil and we harvested them and we could show that five of them produced elevated levels of plant secondary metabolite when they were put under different wavelengths of yeah. uh, blue and red light which is the the absorbed light which gives the the, the plant the the uh, potential to split water and then bind it with carbon dioxide to make uh, the building blocks that synthesize plants so we can actually enhance those plant secondary metabolites within within applied systems so if you move away from the soil based systems but um, this garden is very much an outdoor one it will be seasonal we'll show it through but i don't think there's any reason why in the future we couldn't set up trials to make sure that you've not only got plants which have got high high secondary metabolites so that you want to harvest but also produce that year round and look at the most yeah. economic way of doing it that would be really fun so i think one of the things that you and i have also talked about is having a, a small section maybe in one of the glass houses to grow things that we just can't grow outside um so i've got a cinchona tree that had been you know, i think three or four of them were planted in the the glass house I've got one of the seedlings in my office um, and it seems to be growing quite well. But, you know, th there will be things that we would quite like to grow eventually that just won't stand up to the Scottish climate. Yeah, this fits in really well with the, the review of our collection plan. If you think about what, you know, what is a botanic garden as opposed to the physic garden? It evolved. It was a scientific basis and a modern definition would be that we've got well-documented known provenance plants which have got a purpose um, which is both educational research but also amenity yeah. if you take that into this line I'm, I'm i've been here since 2019 our economic uh, plants which we have on display in the glass house uh, um, have, have served a purpose but i'm reviewing that to see which plants will have better uh, better potential for us in the future and this is perfect it's got gold dust for me because if you're using the plant and want to harvest it and I can display it and tell your story mm. then the, the 80,000 visitors a year that come to the botanic garden are going to be a little bit knowledge more knowledgeable yeah. about the work going on within the university and that can only be a good thing Definitely. Yeah. And so Andrew, just... I, I extend that actually because uh, showing that in country work is fantastic for us as well so you know those links you know this link won't stop here there'll be emails exchanging all the time yeah. So, uh, I, yeah. Do you think, Andrew, that there's anything that you work on in Malawi that we would be able to grow in our garden in Dundee? Yes, um, we have quite a number of species that we are currently working on. So we are working collaboratively. <clears throat> several universities, several local universities have different uh, projects. So what you're doing, for example, in our own university, the Malawi University of Science and Technology, we have a, um, uh, a biology department that focuses on biodiversity. So those people also have quite a number of species that you could be interested maybe to experiment with the Dandy, uh, yeah. Dandy uh, Physic Garden. So I think we really have a good number of them. Yeah, that would be great to, yeah. to cro cross, cross pollinate as such. Oh, yeah. yeah. I've, I've just got one last question. That's uh, now quarter to eight, so we're supposed to be finishing now. Um, is there a concern of people consuming the plants and berries from the garden indiscriminately? This was actually a question that was brought up to me right at the very beginning. And I think what we've done in our selection is excluded anything that is extremely poisonous. Um, the area is quite secure. It's going to have um, cameras in it. Um, it's going to be patrolled by the secu by security. So 
We we really hope not. It's not going to be something that children will be. Able, I don't. There's nothing particularly berries or anything like that that are really colourful and attractive. So we've we've tried not to include anything that will be a danger to the public. Um, we, we've been quite cautious about that when we've um, when we've been selecting. So I would hope that that would pe put people's minds to rest. So I think it just um, just to finish, I would like to thank both Andrew and Kevin for joining me tonight. I, I hope you've enjoyed our, our little conversation. Um, please feel free to get in touch with us if you have any more questions. Keep an eye out if you're in Dundee for that little physic garden or little care medicinal garden starting to, to take root. We have a very small plot with some plants on it. Um, so we're making a beginning. Please keep an eye out and see how it develops. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you.